2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Verses 1 through 14. 2 Kings 2 verses 1 through 14. I'm going to read in the New King James Version. It says, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from, from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. But, but he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. Somebody said, strike it. And it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, may I ask, what may I do for you? Before I am taken away from you, Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. And separated the two of them, and Elijah went up with a, by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah. Say it again. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Today we want to talk to you from the thought, follow the mantle. Somebody shout, follow the mantle. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for an opportunity to teach your people. Use us for your glory now in Jesus' name, and it is so. Clap your hands and give God praise all over the room. And I do want to talk about Catherine Kuhlman because that was the first issue. Of course, I was in one of the early ones too, but Miss Kuhlman has really touched our lives, all of our lives. No one carried the presence of God like she did. The glory of God would walk in literally with her into those amazing meetings. I was about 19 years old when I went to the first Catherine Kuhlman service in Pittsburgh. My life was transformed when she walked on the platform, the presence of Jesus. Uh, it's really hard to explain that part, but so real, so tangible. My life was not the same after that moment because I was truly in the presence of God. I think had Moses walked in or Elijah walked in, they would have said this is the same presence they knew when they ministered on the planet. 
And of course, time after time, we would go to our amazing meetings, and it was really life-changing. But I'll never forget one time I want to tell you all about. We took a lady with us from Toronto, crippled with arthritis totally, and I mean crippled. Uh, every part of her body was twisted. She was bent over, hunched over, and dear Jim Pointer, who took buses in those days from Canada, had asked me and a gentleman named Al Parachin to help this dear lady up and down the bus. Well, she, had a, she was on a little wheelchair. Her husband was carrying her purse. I'll never forget that. And Al and I were responsible to help her up and down and take the wheelchair and put it under the bus. And then every time the bus would stop somewhere for food or whatever, we would go down and take the little wheelchair out and open it and bring her down. So here we are with this lady for two full days because we had to stop and so on. Now the next morning comes. We go to the Catherine Kuhlman service in Pittsburgh. It was Good Friday, the Syria Mosque. I'll never forget that. We go in, we put her down on the third row. We run around, go up on the balcony because seats were filling up fast and were no seats open for us. So we went up on the balcony where we can see this lady sitting down below. And right before service, she said, now, boys, don't let them see my wheelchair because Catherine never allowed any wheelchairs on the main floor. When, when Miss Kuman came on the platform, within minutes, we're looking down, and that lady, who had been twisted with arthritis for years, began to untwist in front of our eyes. Now, imagine if this was you. Miss Kuman just comes on. They just sang, he touched me. You sit down, the presence of God so thick, it's unbelievable, and you look down, and a lady you've been with for two days starts to every part of her body began to untwist. I began screaming on the, on the balcony. I think you, you do the same. That moment has changed my life forever. So Catherine's ministry, truly the headline is, none had the anointing for miracles like Miss Kuhlman since the days of the apostles. And now this woman comes on the platform straight. I mean, he, he or she had been bent over for only God knows how long. She's standing perfect. And just one little finger was, was you couldn't even see it from the balcony, was twisted. And Catherine, in her dramatic way, was reaching over to pray for her. And the lady said, Miss Kuhlman, just a second. She said, he forgot the finger. That, that lady wanted her whole body to be whole totally. And Catherine, in her amazing way, she said, Honey, I will not ask him to do that. He left it that you might remember. <laughs> and that was Miss Kuhlman. Very, very real, very down to earth, and very anointed. And how precious of Jesus to heal the thousands he healed in her ministry, and how grateful we all are. stage and Miss Coleman said what's happening what's happening what's happening and the man came over and told her but let me tell you what it did in that auditorium as I turned with the usher at my hand there was a woman on a stretcher that they had pronounced almost dead they said she'll never make it back mm. to the hospital and her husband put her in the back of a station wagon and drove her to that service. And I held her hand and I said, honey, in the name of Jesus, get off the stretcher. She said, but I can't. And she was looking at her feet. And I said, don't look at your feet, look to Jesus. Oh. She looked up to Jesus. I put my hand out. The usher put his hand out. 
We're nothing, but we were just servants to help her up. The woman's feet hit the floor, and when they did, she ran like a deer. Hallelujah. Listen, listen. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that the same God who did miraculous things during Catherine's day and Amy Semple and McPherson and all the Roberts and all the greats is still alive. How many believe that the God who performs miracles is still alive? Oh, y'all too quiet. How many believe that the miracle worker is still alive? The one who healed in the Bible is still healing today. If you believe it, can you give God a praise because the miracle worker lives. excited to be before you today anybody experienced a miracle this year I don't know who knew. if you've experienced a miracle this year lift your hands and give God a praise right there I said this year so this is how we're gonna do this I'm honored to Stand next to my amazing wife, Pastor Trina, today. So we're going we're gonna to try to teach together today. Um, how we're going to do this, I'm, I'm going to lay some groundwork, and then I'm going to turn over the platform to Pastor Trina, and she'll dig into our text for today. Um, I got to be honest, we probably both prepared way too much for one service. So we got to break this up between two weeks. We'll do that. But um, we believe God has something to say. Um, first of all, we'll break it up between today and fourth Sunday. We have our pastoral anniversary next Sunday. We're praying that everyone comes to worship with us as Apostle Dumas comes to minister. All right. Last week we talked about, wait, can we give God praise for the Morgans? I love... I love them so much. We love them so much. What, what we told them, because, you know, Cartier tried to keep saying, what? And I said, we want to put before the people what we want them to become. Strong families, husbands that love their wives, wives that love their husbands, children that see their parents as an example. How can they become it if they don't see it? So we praise God for the Morgans who are an example of an African-American strong church family. Can we give God a praise for them? Hallelujah. All right, so last week we talked about the roles of sons and daughters in the house and their relationship with mothers, spiritual mothers and fathers. But we talked about uh, what sons and daughters receive from their leaders, right? Wisdom and mantles. Somebody shout, wisdom and mantles. We discussed last week all the, um, the, all the wisdom that you receive from your leaders. You receive wisdom for ministry. You receive wisdom for life. And you receive wisdom for the future. Wisdom for ministry, wisdom for life, and wisdom for the future. But today, we want to talk to you about mantles mantles all right and the reason we played this video is because we wanted you to see that the transfer of mantles is not just an old testament concept right this is something that is happening today it's still happening today another reason why we showed you this video and i'm going to say it because if pastor trina says it she's going to cry and speak in tongues and we won't finish um when when she's been praying about where god is taking us and even this crossover project um he didn't show her ministries to pattern her, ourselves after that are smaller than us he didn't show us ministries that are of the same size as us but he showed us ministries like Jesus, large gatherings where thousands of people come and get healed and delivered and set free. I said large gatherings 
where thousands, I'm not talking about a few people, will, oh, a large gatherings where thousands of people will come and hear the voice of the Lord. They'll be drawn in. They'll, people will come in sick and leave whole. People will come in addicted and leave free. This is our portion. Somebody say it's going to be so for this house. And even if we have to expand and move to different buildings and different places, it's because this is the word of the Lord, not because of our power, not because of what we're able to do, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit. So the spirit of God is going to draw, heal, and deliver. If you believe it, give God a praise for it right now. As it was with Catherine Kuhlman and Benny Hinn and... Bishop Jakes and Carlton Pearson, who hosted these last large gatherings, so shall it be with us. Uh, Lord Jesus, I know that sounds like too much faith. And this, this is not about us. This is not about us. I want you to know that. But this is what God has declared over us. He said to prepare for a harvest, not of people, not of money, but of souls. Prepare for a harvest of souls. If you believe the word of the Lord that was spoken, can you shout a praise? So let's talk about mantles. The word for mantle in Hebrew is adarath. This is what Pastor Trina taught me last night. She got, she studies um, adarath, which also means glory, splendor, magnificence of a vine and shepherds. A vine and shepherds. And that vine definition is important because that means the mantle is supposed to serve as a connector. Yes? Uh, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Meaning what connects you to the Father, this is Jesus saying, what connects you to the Father is me. Likewise, the mantle is supposed to be what connects you to your spiritual father. All right? Uh... Uh, as uh, let me see, some call it spiritual DNA. I'm, what I want to do is make sure we clarify some of these terms we hear online, and we 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 shout about it, but we don't know what we're talking about. Um, spiritual DNA. It, it it's what helps people um, around you understand what you've been connected to. For Catherine Kuhlman and Benny Hinn, the mantle was the ministry of healing. All right? We know that Benny Hinn, Hinn sat under her ministry because of the mantle of grace for healing that was on his life. That was very similar to what was on Catherine Kuhlman's life. It's a mantle. Y'all got that? A, a mantle in the Old Testament was also like, a, it, was, it was actually like a piece of clothing, like a cloak, which, which symbolized a level of authority. All right, slower. The first reference to the word mantle was with Jacob and Esau when Esau was first born. The Bible says he was covered with hair when he was first born, almost like a cloak or a mantle. And since then, the firstborn usually received the mantle of authority, which transitioned from the father. Y'all got me so far? Um, which is why Esau was so angry with Jacob um, when he tricked him into giving him his birthright. Because Jacob used Esau's appetite to trick him into giving him his blessing and his mantle. Tell your neighbor, don't let your appetite make you lose the mantle. Mm. Don't let your desire make you forfeit what's coming. Oh, y'all with me so far? Uh, after Esau and Jacob, um, the mantle was a cloak or a blanket which not only represented authority, but it provided covering and warmth, especially at night. Especially at night. Uh, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> The Bible says, work while it's day, for the hour coming with no man can work. So it's easy to go about working and moving, but it's during the night seasons that you need a covering. Um, somebody shout, I need to be covered. Because I don't care how anointed and powerful you are, every child of God will experience a night season. And it's in the night season that you'll appreciate your covering. No one is saying you're not anointed or you're not chosen. 
Jeremiah was told by, by God, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. But what most people don't know is that Jeremiah was also mentored by a prophet named Zephaniah. And many of the prophecies that Jeremiah gave were originally spoken by the prophet Zephaniah. So even though Jeremiah was a more well-known prophet, he got his grace from the prophet that went before him. So usually the spiritual sons and daughters end up go out doing and doing more than the spiritual fathers. But until you're ready to go out on your own, you receive wisdom and grace. Uh, and the mantle of your leader. Y'all okay so far? Uh, not only do mantles represent spiritual covering, but they also represent spiritual authority and power. And one of the greatest examples of the, in the Bible of a transfer of a mantle of, from the spiritual father to a spiritual son is Elijah to Elisha. All right? Uh, we first meet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. Am I moving fast enough? Okay, um, this was um, during the time where God was starting to get frustrated with Israel and Judah. Why? Because the first command God gave them through Moses is that they wouldn't have no other gods before him. Yet, Israel kept worshiping other gods. One king would come to power and lead the people into worshiping idols, and the next king would tear them down, and then the next king would build them up again, and then the next king would tear them down. And that's what the books of First and Second Kings are all about. It's all about the cycle of disobedience that kept repeating in Israel. Uh, 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 how many of us can be honest? Uh, oh, Lord. How many of us can be honest and say God warned us during our disobedience, but we still disobeyed. God kept sending prophets to warn Israel about what was coming, but they kept disobeying. He, sent a, he, he, sent, he sends us warnings too. He sends us warnings through the Holy Spirit. He sends us warning through prophets and trusted voices. He even sent a warning through the word, but we still do uh, what we want to do. Not only did Israel ignore the warnings, but in 1 Kings chapter 16, a new king came to power named Ahab. And the Bible says he was worse than all the kings before him. Um, because not only did he worship idols, but he married a woman uh, named Jezebel. And he started to worship the God that she worshiped named Baal. Um, how many of y'all watch Tim Ross? Y'all know who Tim Ross? Tim says something so powerful. Tim said Jezebel has no power. Her power is her influence. Her power is her connection to the one who has power. Whoa. Some of you are afraid of the people that really don't have any power over you. But you need, what you need to pray about is their connection to the one who actually has power. Y'all will get that later. Um, Y'all praying against Jezebel like, power, like Jezebel can do something to you. But what you need to do is pray for the king. Because the king is the one that needs to shut down the power of Jezebel. wife and because Ahab loved his wife he started worshiping Baal um, now if I had time I would I would talk about why it's so important to be wise regarding your relationship because who you marry affects your destiny uh, uh, and the people you build covenant with have the power to affect your relationship with the father uh, now, now, if you're already married, I'm not telling you to get divorced. Please hear me. I don't want nobody's husband to call me. Nobody's wife to call me. Say, you told them to divorce me. The devil is a liar. I did not. But for those of you that are single and met somebody in the club, are we going to be honest sons and daughters or not? 
and they told you, I don't do all that church stuff. But then you say, well, well I believe if I, if I just pray and keep living the right life before them, then I can connect them to God. Well, how are you going to connect them to God when you're drinking with them, smoking with them, having sex with them? Are you bringing them to God or are they taking you away from him? Oh, y'all ready for this conversation? Uh, uh, well, there's, some, there's nobody in the church that I want. What do I do? Wait! Oh, y'all didn't hear me. I wish I could shout it as long as... Pastor, you shout, wait. Wait, fellas, until you find a lady, or ladies, wait till a man finds you that honors and believes what you believe. I'm not saying they have to be a member of this church. I would love it if they were. But they should at least believe in your God. And I don't mean somebody that says, yeah, I believe there's a God. No, that's not enough. Wait for somebody that has a relationship with God. And they value that relationship more than they value a relationship with you. And they Be need to speak in tongues. Because if they're doing it for you, when they're mad at you, they're going to leave him. Uh, King Ahab did not wait. He married Jezebel and they disobeyed God. Y'all all right? They disobeyed God and immediately started to set up a temple and an altar to worship Baal. Now I need you to see why God was so angry about this. The people of Israel were rescued by God from Egypt. They were rescued by God. And then not only did God rescue them, he gave them a land that he promised to their forefather, Abraham. Gave it to them. There was no way the people of Israel would have had enough power to overtake Jericho had God not intervened. So God gave them this land, but yet, on the land that God gave them, they set up a temple for another God. Can you imagine how mad that would make you? It's no different than when we say, God, I want this house. But then once you get it, you do everything in the house other than what God said. God, I want this car. But once you get the car, you drive it to everywhere else. I'm so glad I live in this time. Aren't you glad we live in a dispensation of grace? Lord, because if we lived in the Old Testament, God, who is rich in mercy, still didn't destroy Israel. Instead, he sent a drought. He sent a drought. I need you to hear this. Droughts are God's response to disobedience. Ooh. You don't want to listen to me? Then do it on your own. You think you can do it without me? Well, use your own resources. But when your resources run out, you'll realize that the only way you were able to do what you were doing was because of, because you were connected to me. Here's a life hack, y'all ready? When you notice that all the resources in your life are dried up, start looking for disobeyed instructions. Start to look for any area where, you, where God told you to do something and you didn't do it. Is there any wisdom that God has given you that you've ignored? 
Because I guarantee you, if you're experiencing a drought, God either told you to do something that you didn't do, or he warned you about it before it came. God sent Elijah, and the first thing he did, the first thing he did was declare the drought. Elijah came on the scene. We don't know where he came from. He just came in and said, by my word, there will be no rain. And from then on, Israel was in a drought. But here's the thing. Elijah was also affected by the drought he declared. But even though there was a drought in Israel, God still made sure there was food for the prophet Elijah. I came to talk to the person that God gave an instruction to, because, but you're afraid to carry it out because you don't know how it's going to affect you. Uh, I need you to understand that God always provides for his sons and daughters. Oh, and even if there's a drought in the land, you will always have enough. Somebody shout, I'll always have enough. Even if he has to feed you with birds, he'll make sure your needs are met. I think I told y'all this before, but I hear the Lord echoing this again. Prepare for provision from strange places. I don't know who receives that in the room. Prepare for, for provision from strange places. Look at your neighbor and say, prepare for provision from strange places. Now, if you believe that, give God a praise for it right now. It's coming. It's coming. We got witnesses. He's sending checks in the mail. Lost money found. Bills decreased and paid off. Anybody receive provision this year from places you didn't expect it to come from? The Bible says, I'm moving, in the third year of the drought, I'm in 1 Kings 18 now for the purposes. I know they're the only ones that follow me. Um, I'm in 1 Kings 18. Elijah was in the drought, and on, in the, on the third year, he went to confront King Ahab. And the Bible says, in 1 Kings 18, that there were 850 prophets of other gods. Y'all didn't hear me. 850 prophets of other gods, which means that there are prophets. Just because you hear the title prophet doesn't mean they're automatically speaking from God. I know you got the title, but who's your source of information? From other gods. And, and, and they, God, God was empowering Elijah to defeat all these prophets. And not only did Elijah defeat these prophets in a contest of seeing who God, who God would respond, but Elijah executed. Oh, he killed them. I, t I told y'all, you better be glad we live in 2023. He killed 850 prophets of, of, of Asherah and Baal, not God's prophets. He killed 850 prophets. Asherah and Baal were other gods, and those gods had prophets. And our God, the Lord God of Israel, defeated and killed all 850 of them. And then right after that, in 1 Kings 18 and 41, Elijah told King Ahab, now go get something to eat and drink. For I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Uh, th this is in a drought. I said this is in a drought. And Elijah is saying, prepare for a rainstorm. That's where we get the song, I may not see, but I hear, I hear rain. It's getting ready to. Somebody in here is looking at a drought right now. But I hear the Lord say, get ready for rain. I don't know who receives it. I may not see it. Get this. 
this, and we're going to jump off of this. Elijah started praying, and then he told his servant to go look and see if he saw anything. But the servant says, I don't see nothing. Then he told them six more times, go look, go look again. Yet there were no signs of rain, but finally the servant said, I see a cloud. The size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And check me out in the scripture. And the Bible says, and Elijah shouted, uh, which means it may start small. But it's going to end up in overflow. Oh, I don't know who can receive it in the room. But can you shout even while it's small? I said, can you shout while it's small? The business is small. The raise was small. The dream was small. But I believe God is going to bring it to overflow. If you believe God for growth, open your mouth and give God a praise. It's going to start small. It's going to start small. But I'm, I'm about to have more than enough. I'm about to go into overflow. What started as a seed is going to end up being a harvest. I dare to give God a praise for a harvest right now. Listen. That's why the, the scripture says, despise not the day of Because it's about to get big. Tell your neighbor, it's going to be bigger. It's going to be bigger now unto him who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power. After Elijah prayed, a rainstorm came. And verse 46 says that God gave Elijah special strength to outrun the chariots. Oh, how many believe you're about to get special strength? I God's about to, they that wait on the Lord shall read. He gave him special strength to outrun the chariots. So they wouldn't get caught in the rain. <laughs> oh, that, that all happened. Let me calm down. That all happened. Elijah declared a drought, defeated the prophets, declared a rainstorm, and outran chariots. Did all of that. But then in 1 Kings 19, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. And said, by this time tomorrow, you'll be dead. And this man, who just defeated 850 prophets and outran chariots, ran for his life. Why is that important? Because I need you to understand that spiritual leaders are not perfect. Do y'all hear me? And, and, and I, as a matter of fact, most leaders have areas that they're really strong in. And they have other areas. We're all the honest people. Huh? They have other areas that they're really. Not, not only are they weak, but they're terrified. Oh, I want to be honest with y'all. Uh, let me, let me tell you something. Let me testify. I'm going to testify. The Morgans did it. I'm going to testify too. Um, I've sang in stadiums. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you that this is, what, this is my reality. Uh, the, the biggest audience I've sang in front of had 600,000 people all worshiping at the same time. And I was not scared. I was not afraid. But then the moment that my son put a camera in front of me and said, preach. <laughs> I was terrified. 
my poor son would spend three days editing a video that it took me 20 minutes to preach because I kept going back, well, this should be better. That should be better. I should have said that this way. And I was expecting him to create something that was not there. Because there are some areas where we have a whole lot of confidence in. Are we going to be honest leaders? But there are some areas where we need God to show up. That's why the scripture says, in my weakness, his strength. His strength is made perfect in my, that's why Paul said, I will glory in my infirmities. Because where I'm weak, that's where he is. God is not, uh, somebody said it the other week, and, and I said, Lord, thank you for somebody speaking the truth. God is never going to assign you to do something that you can do without him. So if you feel weak at it, that's probably God saying that's where you're supposed to be. Because the areas you feel very confident in, you'll brag about what you do because you feel like, I got this. But the areas you don't got, that's where God steps in and shows up. That's why there's a grace on this house. Because I, God knows I can't do this without him. is preaching something that made us nervous, but there are also as aspects of ministry that Pastor Trina and I are just starting to embrace. That means it takes time. For some of you, you're comparing what you're doing now to people who have been doing it for years. And you're going into depression and saying, I must not be good at this, why am I failing? No, you're not failing, you're growing. And growth takes time. And failure is a part of growth. Uh, but I don't, what I don't want you to do is take these messages and make you think that we believe we're perfect. But get this. Our imperfections don't remove our mantle. Uh, we may not be perfect, but there's still a grace on our lives. Uh, Elijah was an imperfect prophet. I, want, I know y'all want to hear from Pastor Trina now. Uh, Elijah was an imperfect prophet. Some say he was depressed. We know for a fact that he was suicidal. He was suicidal. We know that because in 1 Kings 19 and 4, Elijah prayed that he might die. He said, Lord, take my life. I've had enough. He just had this major victory. Isn't it funny that right after your victory, oh, that's when you f face the biggest struggle. Right after you have your biggest win is when you go through your biggest emotional fight. fight. Oh, are there any witnesses in the room? But that does not take away the victory. Uh, uh, God said, oh, you, know, you know, when Elijah started bugging out, God sent an angel said, go get Elijah. Bring him to Mount Sinai because he bugging. He brought him to him. And get this, um, Elijah had an encounter with God at Mount Sinai. But what God said to Elijah was different. He didn't come with a whole lot of reassurances, and he didn't say thee and thou. I, I know we want King James in every aspect. Elder Nicole, I'm sorry. He didn't say thee and thou. He said, what you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And is there a, 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 is, is this, this, this is another reason why we know Elijah was imperfect, because Elijah said, he started going to blame game. Because the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. Isn't that funny how we blame everybody else? Oh, y'all quiet now. We blame everybody else. The people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. And get this, 
and I'm the only prophet left. Now get this, 1 Kings 20 to 2 Kings chapter 1 had all these other prophets that God was using. Who told Elijah that he was the only one? Who told you that you were the only one going through what you're going through? Who told you that you're the only anointed one? Who told you you're the only accurate prophet? Uh, uh, Elijah said, I'm the only prophet left. Uh, and then he started, he actually believed that. But then, get this, God told Elijah, go in front of the mountain. And the Bible says that a windstorm came, but God wasn't in the wind. Then an earthquake came, but God wasn't in the earthquake. Then a fire came, but then God wasn't in the fire. All that stuff was big and loud, but God wasn't in it. Why is that important? Because many of us think that we can measure a move of God by volume. But there's some stuff out there that's loud. But God ain't in it. I ain't talking about nobody's church. But just because it's loud, don't mean it's God. The Bible says in, in verse 12 that after all the noise and fire, Elijah heard a sound of a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. And, 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 and get this, I'm, I'm going to whisper it now. The New, the New King, James, King James Version says in verse 13 that when Elijah heard God, he wrapped his face in the mantle. So the first time we see the mantle is not when it was time to perform a miracle. The first time we hear of the mantle is not when it was time to anoint Elisha. But the first time we see the mantle is in the presence of God. Oh, mantles are established in the presence of God. I don't know who wants to hear that. Because you think that you, you, you just get activated and you just start moving. But if you don't saturate yourself in the presence of God first. Oh, you want to be activated. But when is the last time you spent God, time in God's presence? When you didn't have a stage. Oh. When nobody was looking at you. When's the last time you were on your face? Oh, everybody say mantles are established in God's presence. You can't have a mantle that's not in the presence of God. Our presence is not good enough. You can't be anointed because you're around us. Uh, uh, mm, I, I, I'm trying to be careful because many people think that because you're in the house and you're in a house that's anointed, that means you're automatically anointed. And you can, be, you can feel an activation in the room. Uh, how do I know this? You need Bible for it. Okay. Um, go, go, uh, uh, um, Samuel told Saul, go down, and there's going to be about a, some prophets down there. Go hang with them for a minute. And while you're with them, you're going to start prophesying. But Saul was not a prophet. He was activated in the presence of other prophets. Just because you're in this room, you feel activated. But you don't walk out thinking, well, I must be a prophet now. The devil is a liar. That does not mean that that's your grace. And many of us get tricked up because we try to walk in the grace that we felt. But not that's on us. 
You may feel it. Let me move. Uh, God starts to talk to Elijah again. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And, he, and, and just as he said before, and, and, and then Elijah it starts to respond to God. But I need you to hear this too. Um, how do we know that it's God's voice talking? Usually, it's a confirmation of something that was already said. When God, you would think that when God brings Elijah to this moment, he's about to give him this fresh word. But he reminds him of what he already said. Some of you are looking for something fresh, and God has given you a refresh. I already told you what to do. So now I'm going to remind you. Let me move. Uh, uh, let me, uh, God is... Asked Elijah, what was he doing here? And God gave Elijah several instructions. Pastor Trina, I'm ready for you in T minus five. He said, go back the same way you came. That was the first instruction. Then he said, go anoint the next king. Second instruction. And go anoint the next prophet, Elisha. Now why is that important? Because we as spiritual sons and daughters sometimes believe that God's only instructions to the spiritual fathers are to take care of us. We don't take into account that God told the leaders anything else besides what they had to do with us. Uh, so so if, I, if you send me a text or a call, it's like, oh, my pastor ignored me. As if God didn't tell me nothing else. As if I have nothing else to do but sit in the house and wait for your text. Meanwhile, you so busy that you can't hardly make it to church. Because life is life in. And you got this vacation. And that class and that job. But if I ignore one text, if I miss one text, then I miss God and you. Why is it that when I don't hear from you, I should understand? But when you don't hear from me, you're rejected. Uh, verse 19 says, Elijah went and found Elisha plowing in a field. And Elijah took the same mantle that Elijah covered his face in, in the presence of God, and brushed it across the shoulders of Elisha. Yeah. Yeah. But Elisha ran after Elijah and said, let me go kiss my mother and father, and I'm going I'm, I'm to go with you. Why is that important? Because oftentimes, I don't, I don't want to make y'all mad today. Pastor Trina is going to shout y'all, I promise. Uh, 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 many, many times people leave other houses or they leave another mother and father or another ministry, but you try to bring everything about that father. And everything about that mother and make me live up to that person. But if you're going to follow this mantle, you have to kiss all of that good and accept the leadership and the mantle that you're following. Don't try to hold us accountable and, to resp and responsible to all of their standards, their practices, their failures. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, kiss it goodbye. <laughs> we praise God for where you came from. We would.
would never want you to disrespect what you learned or where you came from. But if you're going to follow this, don't try to make us them. Tell your neighbor it's a different grace. That's why Elijah said, before you go back, make sure you think about it. Check me out in the scripture. Elijah said to Elisha, Elisha was, I'm, I'm going back. No, wait. Before you cancel your membership, before you leave it, think about what you're doing. Because I'm not going to change my leadership because you're following me. Y'all so quiet now. Oh. Uh. Another thing I need you to consider that if you're going to receive the fullness of what God has for you, there's some things you're going to have to say goodbye to. The problem is we try to move forward, but we bring our past with us. But you can't have this and bring that too. You can't have your future and bring your past. Somebody shout, leave it. Y'all all right? Y'all mad, man? Y'all mad at me? Elijah kissed his parents goodbye. Then verse 21 says, he returned to the oxen and sacrificed them. Now, many of you say you want to follow your leader and you want the same grace that rests on them, but what have you sacrificed? I know what you want to gain, but what have you given up? Most of us want everything at our convenience, but ministry is not convenient. You can't put it on your schedule. Y'all mad at me now. I know. That's okay. I'll make it up to you next week. If you want to flow under the oil, you're going to have to give something up. You have to give up your will. When is the last time you put your will on the altar? When is the last time you put your feelings on the altar? Um, I'm done. The Bible says he sacrificed the oxen, then he followed Elijah as his assistant. Oh, uh, as his assistant. Not his partner. Not his counselor. But his assistant. And get this, he didn't stay at the house and say, I'm going to wait till Elijah come and get me. But Elisha followed Elijah. It's a shame that because of the self-appreciation and self-help teaching that we've been receiving, that we've raised an entitled people. And many of the sons and daughters expect the father to follow them. Oh, y'all mad. I know. I'm so sorry. I'm going to check on you. I love you. You're my pastor. Why didn't you call me? Why don't you check on me? I love every one of y'all. Y'all know that? Do y'all believe that? Yeah. Pastor Trina talks about y'all more than... No, yeah. And I pray for y'all consistently. But I don't need your approval to pastor the way I pastor this church. Uh, the Bible says that Elisha followed Elijah as his assistant. So that means if you believe in your spiritual leader and the mantle on their lives, then you have to follow and assist as we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Elisha shows us, Pastor, did get your notes? <laughs> Elisha shows us the difference between being activated and being submitted. 
This is the difference between me getting a touch and becoming a son. Some of us would have been satisfied with just receiving a brush of the, of the mantle. But Elijah said, I want to sit under it. I, I, there's some wisdom here I got to grow from. I need to be pastored by it. Now we're moving. Thank you. To 2 Kings chapter 2. Thank you so much. I need to move this back because all things are in order in this house and I dare not step in front and leave Pastor JJ behind me. Um, how many of you saw uh, Michael Jackson's last movie that he did uh, called This Is It? Yeah, and in that documentary, he, he was getting on the workers, but as he was coming down on them, he was like, it's all in love. Everything is in love. Amen. And so that's what I want to tell you today. Everything is in love. I want to tell you this before I start, um, because there's a lot for me to say. And, but I want you to know that it's all in love. Amen. And uh, many of you know that I have been talking about this uh, project crossover that I am so excited about. I'm so excited, so excited about the vision and what God has given us. But I do understand that some housekeeping needs to be done before we can move on to our next. And I do realize that we have um, a family of people who may not have been raised in church like I was. And so there is a lot of teaching and grooming in this season that needs to happen. And so I want you to understand where I am coming from as I'm saying this. And I don't want to break the flow. I don't know why Pastor JJ told y'all that I'm going to shout you because I'm definitely not going to shout you. That's, that's not what's going to happen today. Um, but he, he led up into 2 Kings. And here's where I want to, just to remind you of what he read earlier. 2 Kings 2 and 1. It says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling to Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. I want to stop there because I want to give you my first point and, and, and I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I wish somebody would put a timer on the clock just so I can see where I'm at. I know that we're not going to finish this. Um, but the, the journey that they took, if you read the, the second chapter of, of Second Kings, the journey that they took was from Gilgal to Bethel. Then they went from Bethel to Jericho. And then they went from Jericho to the Jordan River. Right? That was where um, the Lord was speaking to Elijah and he was telling him where he was going next. And every time he went to where he was next, a group of prophets went out to Elisha and they said, do you know that the Lord is going to take up your master? And he said, I know. But here's what I want you to see. From Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho to Jordan River, in these four locations, Elisha refused to leave Elijah. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Elisha refused to leave Elijah. He, he repeatedly said, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as you live, I will never leave you. The reason why this journey and the places that they went is so important because uh, that, that whole thing is very reminiscent of the journey taken by the Israelites. For those of you who are not Bible scholars, if you go back to the beginning of time, the children of Israel were promised some land, but they had a journey to take in order to get to the destination. And when they first entered into the promised land, it was the journey, this is the journey that coincided with the pass off of Moses to Joshua. 
All right, so what I'm trying to get you to see is that there is a pattern there that we can apply and that every succession plan has a journey. So some of you um, don't walk with your leaders long enough to complete the succession plan. Uh, there is a full journey from place to place to place to place to place, which is another reason why we have what we call wayward sons. And they're preaching and they're teaching and they're all over the internet. And I'm not trying to dip and dab and point jabs. Remember, it's all in love. But this is what I'm saying. There's some wayward sons out there. They have no covering because they left the journey too early. And so now they're trying to chart over into uncharted territory with no wisdom and no covering. And so uh, can I tell you that um, there's some things to your benefit um, because, and this is why it's so important that you stay with your leader. I like the fact that Elijah said, I'm not going to leave you because see, some people have plans to leave already. I know, I know you've been talking and you said, you know, I'm only giving Anwar DC a certain amount of months and then I'm leaving, I got to go. Well, you're leaving, but when you do leave, don't say I sent you because you didn't stay with me for the journey. This is why it's so important that leaders stay or that you stay for your mantle because some of your leaders will teach you what to do and then sometimes your leaders will teach you what not to do. You heard the man of God just talk about how Elijah was not a perfect prophet. But Elisha did not use that as an excuse. He said, I will not leave you. As sure as you are breathing and as sure as God is God, I am not leaving you. But you've got to take note of all the good things and the bad things that, may, that you may see in your leader. You may see some imperfections of mine. I'm not trying to hide them. If you ask me, I'll probably tell you what they are. But whatever it is, you can learn from that. Since when have we lost the day that we learn from other people's mistakes? Why do you have to be the one to prove that it can be different? Don't the Bible say say there's nothing new under the sun if it was here before it's going to be here again the same trials that I may have faced in my time trust me you're going to come along and you're going to do them too but if you've got wisdom and the mantle you will know how to do it Woo, Jesus okay it's too early for me to get excited uh uh, I can say in our history, and Pastor JJ in our history, uh, we have learned a lot of how to's and how not to's. Um, when we, we did not leave when we saw the how nots. Uh, great leaders, what you have to understand is great leaders are groomed to be strategic. Uh, be strategic is, is enough to stay. Um, being strategic is enough to stay and learn from the mistakes. One, what I like about this is one, one of the key indicators of true sons and daughters, because that's what we're still talking about. One of the key indicators of true sons and daughters is that they do not plan to leave. Let me tell you, um, it's not just for the benefit of the leader. It is also for your benefit as a son and daughter. True sons and daughters position and posture themselves because they realize that they have a spiritual father and a spiritual mother. And not only do they have the spiritual father and the spiritual mother, but that mother and that father has something for them. The thing I like about Elisha is he realized that it was not just about Elijah. It was about what Elijah had that Elisha knew belonged to him. Elijah knew that Eli Elisha knew that Elijah had a mantle that was one day going to fall and that he was going to pick up. And he would not allow separation to come between them until he got what he needed. I want to ask you, why are you letting little squabbles separate me from you? 
Why are you letting little nuances and little growth spurts and things that people have, why would you let that separate if you really believe that I got a mantle that you're going to need in the next phase of your life? Why are you so discouraged when the first thing goes wrong? Y'all, we only been pastors for about three or four years. Don't you know that growing takes time and there's going to be some little things? But if you really are a true son and daughter, it's all in love. It's all in love. Now, let me preface this next statement. I, I want to say this because I do understand that some people will leave. I know, I know, I know, I know. Everybody that started out with you in the beginning ain't going to be there in the end. And I'm very, very aware of that. But I'm talking about the premature decisions. Those are the ones that I'm concerned about. When you prematurely tell me and Pastor JJ that you're leaving, what you're saying is, I don't have anything for you. What you're saying, Liz, when you, when you tell me you're leaving, you tell me, I am not your son and I am not your daughter. You don't have anything. The, uh, the purpose here is no longer serving you. And, and, and it might be because you were probably coming with the intentions to show me your talents. But what you did not do is you did not allow me the proper time to show you what you need for your future. Now, let me tell you, if that's what you believe, I, you know, I'm not going to hold you. I, I'm, I told my leaders the other day, I, I'm not going to hold nobody. Um, it's all in love. It really is. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic. But if you feel like your time is up, I'm not going to hold you. Uh... Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, there is enough evidence. Pastor JJ, you nervous? I know it makes him nervous. Okay. Uh, there is enough evidence in this text to prove that Elijah was testing the faithfulness of Elisha. See, what you have to understand about Pastor Trina is I've never been the person to lay all my cards out on the table at once. I'm a very, very careful watcher, and I watch for a very long time. And I feel like Elijah was a little bit of the same way because he tested Elijah. Every time he went to Elijah, he told him, he said, God is telling me to go here. You can stay. But Elijah said, no, I'm not staying I, I, I'm not staying here. I'm going with you because I, he didn't tell him this, but he knew in the back of his mind, you got something I need. So the relationship could not be over. Uh, surely Elijah could not give Elisha a mantle without knowing whether or not he can trust him to use it in the way that he would use it. A lot of y'all are ready for me to lay hands and say, oh, it's on you, but I don't know what you're going to do with that when you leave my presence. And I don't know who you're going to pack up your suitcase and whose house you're going to go to next. Talking about, I'm praying like Pastor Trina and I'm prophesying like Pastor Trina. No, 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 no. I've got to see where you act in your life. What does your life look like? What are you living like when you... See, that to me matters. Your integrity and what you do with it is the foundation of what I can lay on you. I'm not laying a mantle on a broken foundation. That's not the kind of leader that I am. I need to make sure that you are whole before I deposit something into you. Not going to break my legacy. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you're going to say Pastor Trina sent you, you're going to say Pastor Trina reared me for this. It's all in love. It's all in love. I want you to understand that following is deeper than just a click of a button on an Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Following will cost you something. It'll cost you you. Here's the truth of the matter. When uh, I was serving under, or was still serving under Pastor Steven Stevenson, it cost me me. Uh, we were very, I was very, Pastor JJ was always very active in ministry. I was active in ministry in my dad's church. 
And then we left my dad's church and he took me to a whole nother denomination. And I was like, what they do here? I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where I fit in, fit in because what I carried on my life was so different from the atmosphere where I was at. And so I got in a place, admittedly, I got in a place of stagnation and I began to be silent. Besides in my house, now I ain't never stopped in my house. I'm always praying. I'm always prophesying. I'm always feeding his ear with something and my children's ear with something. But in public, I had kind of like, mm, I'm going to sit this one out because y'all don't do the way I do. I don't know where, I, where this puzzle fits. Uh, but then when Apostle Stevenson saw me, um, he said, there's something inside of you that's dormant. And he said, I, I need to pull that out of you. And so what it required me to do is step outside of what I was comfortable doing. Here's the point. When you step into a mantle, it is no longer about you. It is no longer about what you want to look like. It is no longer about what you want to sound like. It is no longer about what you want to hang out and do. It is no longer about you, period. God, I want all of you and take all of me. It costs you something. Following will cost you something. And so, and so that's where we're at now. And that's what I have to, I have to understand. And I have to see, I have to see that you're going to put down your ways. I have to see that you're not going to go off on nobody. Now, plus me, there's been plenty of times where I came in here and I didn't feel myself. You know, they say, sometimes you feel like a nut and sometimes you don't. There's been plenty of times where I came in here feeling like a nut, but because I understand the anointing on my life, you would never know it. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will put Put down their nasty attitudes. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will say, God, no longer I, not my will, but your will be done. That's the foundation that I am ready to lay a mantle upon. Someone who is trustworthy. Someone who can turn it off when it's time. I know you're going through. I know your circumstances are not like what you want them to be. But for God, I live. And for God, I'll die. Woo. Jesus, my God, and that dying that I'm talking about, just so you know, that doesn't always mean a physical death. That means die to your flesh. Woo. And any kind of death, I don't care how it comes, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts to come in here and have to smile when you know everything in hell is raising up against you. That's dying. You're dying to your flesh. It hurts to come in here and know that people have been talking about you since last Sunday. That hurts. But I've got to die to it. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts to be in here where everybody looks like they got everything they need. But then you go home and can't pay your bills. It hurts. It hurts. But that's the cost of a mantle. That is the cost of it. Okay, y'all sit down, sit down. I want you to understand that this is not even about JJ and Trina. This is, this is not about us. What you're seeking is the oil on our lives. God placed us here so that we can pour into a select people. God placed you here because you are the people that God would have us pour into. Everything that I've been through in my life, I'm supposed to testify and tell you about it. So then I'm building you up so that you can go out and build up somebody else. Jesus, and you've got your nerve to say, I'm not going to be here anymore. You ain't got what you need yet to survive. I'm looking for true sons and daughters. I'm going to have to take these shoes off. Jesus. Elisha. Elisha was so sure of what he wanted. He said, I heard what you said, Elijah. I heard you say that I can stay here, but no, nah, I can't do that, sir. I've got to go with you. I love you, but even more, there's something on your life that I need. True sons and daughters will come to me and say, Pastor Trina, I love you, but even more so, there's something on your life 
that I need. That is, the, that is the evidence of a true son and daughter. Jesus. Now, I'm going to try to calm down on this because I want you all to hear me because I'm using the example of Elijah and Elisha. But I want you to remember the story of Ruth and Naomi. Come on, daughters. I want my daughters to remember. I want you to remember how Orpah left. Orpah said, I understand, Naomi. And Naomi wasn't mad. She wasn't mad. She said, I understand. I, I can't do for you what I originally could. So Orpah said, I got to go. She, they kissed and said goodbye. We don't have to be mad at each other. If you're the Orpah in my life, it's okay. For a season, I've been real good to you. But now I'm looking for the roofs. I'm looking for the roofs that understand that there's something more. I'm looking for the roofs that understand that God will take little and make it much. I'm looking for the roofs who understand that sometimes you've got to press in a little deeper. I'm looking for the roofs who are not afraid to follow just a little bit longer. I'm looking for the roofs who even have dreams and visions themselves. I'm looking for the roofs who can one day hold my arms up. I'm looking for the roofs who can say, Pastor, you sit down. Let me take this one for you. I'm looking for the roofs to come forth and say, Good. I've got provision for you now, Pastor. You've provided for me for so long. But now I've got a land of O'Shea on nine. Woo. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need the roofs to stand up. I need the roofs. I need the roofs. So if there are some orpas in the room, I understand. We can kiss and say goodbye. But I'm going with the goers. I'm going with the ones who mean Jesus all the way. I'm going with the ones who are not ready to quit. I'm going to the ones who believe that even though something may come their way, that there is more to this story. The story has not ended. The story really has just begun. Woo. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Woo. I feel emotional on that, and I don't know why. I'm not a crybaby. I don't, I don't cry a lot. Not unless, not unless you mess with my family. I really don't cry. But I feel emotional on that, and I don't know why. I, I feel like God is pulling on some roofs. And he may be pulling on some roofs and dismissing some orpas. But God, it's all right. Have your way, Lord. We have your way, Lord Jesus. It's time for the roofs of the true sons and daughters to stand up. Okay, let's move. Let's move. Let's move. All right. The third verse, the third verse, the first point, the first point was where I said that I will not leave. How many can say I will not leave? Thank you, Lord. I don't want to put you under no pressure, but I want you to mean that from your heart. The second point in the third verse, it's all in love, right? It's all in love. Y'all still love me? Okay. The third verse, a group of prophets from Bethel came to Elijah. And me and Pastor JJ had some of the same notes. Uh, but a group of prophets came from Bethel to Elijah and they asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Uh, now it sounds like they were giving him a word of warning. Those of you who are prophetic know what that's like. Sounds like they were just giving him a word of warning. And, and I don't want to think that this was maliciously done. Um, I, don't, I don't think that they had the wrong intent. There's nothing in the scripture that indicates to me that they had the wrong intent. Although some people may come in your life and give you a word of warning, put on your seatbelts, because they're jealous of the proximity that you have to your leaders. You see, you have to understand there was a school of prophets. There were a lot of prophets here. But Elisha had the ear of Elijah. And so some of these words of warning that you all are getting do not come from a clean heart and pure hands. 
some of the words of warning that you begin in is because they're jealous that it looks like they have more proximity to what's up here than you do. But that would be me. I'm just inserting my thoughts because I know that uh, I know how today's prophets do. Um, they pass out prophetic words that really cast their feelings and their emotions about proximity to us. Let me move along lest I be guilty of calling out the false prophets. And I don't know if that's why they kept coming to Elisha, but every time they move to a new location, isn't it convenient? that every time they moved to a new location, that a group of prophets would come to him and say, you know he's about to die. You know he's about to leave you. Just sowing seeds. And see, that's what some of us do. We just sow seeds. And then those seeds fester in people's minds and they get discouraged and want to leave. Not because of what I did, but because of what you said. Can I say this? Until further notice, I don't want nobody speaking for me. Just until further notice. If somebody came to you and said, Pastor Trina said X, Y, and Z, you say, well, I'll wait for Pastor Trina to tell me. Let me tell you, I know the church is growing, but we ain't that large. If I got something to say to you, I can get to you. Now we preparing, we preparing to have a big roster of people and there may come a day where I can't contact you like I used to contact you, but the day ain't here yet. I'm telling you now by the power and authority that's vested in me, if anybody ever come and tell you, you know Pastor Trina gonna do this to move you out the way, you know Pastor Trina is doing this to gear up something, tell them I'll wait, I'll wait, I'm gonna stay right here like Elijah. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay right here and plant myself. Why? Because my name is Ruth and that's my Naomi. Woo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I don't think I have to touch that any longer. Let's move on to the next text because I'm running out of time. Uh, because that's really not the point that I wanted to make in this text. Um, the point that I wanted to make is that when the prophets came to Elisha and they said, you know your master is about to leave, it's the way he responded that made the difference. He said, I know. See, you forget, and I want to remind you, God speaks to you too. Don't you forget that. So, so Elisha said, I know. But here's the second thing he said. Be quiet. Don't say nothing. Don't say it. Y'all have got to train people from putting garbage in your ears. Don't let, I don't understand how we became trash receptacles. That everything somebody say, we just receive it and we internalize it and then it boils up and it implodes. And all of a sudden you're having issues with all nations DC and it has nothing to do with me and Pastor JJ. Okay, Elisha said, be quiet about it. Now, listen, I gotta, cause I know my audience, I know who I'm talking to. I don't want y'all going off on nobody. It's all in love, you remember? Y'all Washingtonians and y'all Baltimore and y'all Maryland people, I know how you do. Don't go off on nobody. I'm not trying to start no wars. You can say nicely, well, I will wait for Pastor Trina. You know why that's important? Because that's the way your leaders do. Can't nobody ever tell you that Pastor JJ or Pastor Trina went off on me. Can you? You can't say that. No, I know. I know because I know who I am. <laughs> You've got to have the spirit of your leaders. Remember, I told you, it doesn't look 
like you. The mantle, the mantle does not look like you. The mantle is always going to stretch you to think higher, do higher. So whatever it is that you would do, whatever it is that you would say, reframe it, step back. Even if you have to say, I'm not ready to have this conversation, praise the Lord. I'm not ready. What did Pastor JJ say last week? I don't have time. Yeah. Okay. That's the point I really wanted to make, that Elisha said, be quiet about it. All prophecy, be it word of wisdom, word of knowledge, is not meant for you to say. And see, this is why I think, I have to say this because we're establishing prophets in the house. And I have to lay down this groundwork so that you all know how this is going to operate. Some of y'all think that you have to say it. You don't have to say it. You don't. Uh, you, you need to be trained how to ask God, Lord, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? When is the right time for me to say it? Because when I go to somebody, I want them to have the heart to receive what I'm saying. And you may roll up somebody the wrong day, the wrong time, and they may not receive the authentic word of the Lord because it was not the right timing. So you've got to learn how to hold on to what you got and follow order. Jesus. Say, Lord, what do I do with this? When is the right time? One of the commentaries indicated that these were young prophets. They were young. They, they were in the school of prophets. Um, it is a sign of a young, underdeveloped prophet when you feel like you have to say everything you see as soon as you see it. And I'm not saying this to dis prophets. Y'all know, but there's one thing, I, two things I love. That is intercession and prophecy. I am not saying this to condemn prophecy. I am saying it because everything needs order. Everything. And I'm just, I, I, when I see stuff like that or when I hear stuff like that, when I hear that there are prophets going from ear to ear in this house and you have not been ordained to do so, I'm not saying that you're not a prophet. I'm saying you're underdeveloped. You're underdeveloped. Uh, when you get a word about a leader, you spread it to their protege. Or you tell your friend in the sister group. Or you tell a member who just had a misunderstanding with the pastor. Y'all love to look for opportunities for people who are on the outs with us. Because then you'll say, oh, I got a word about that. I knew that they were going to do that a long time ago. The devil is a liar. It's all love. It's all love. What I need you to understand is I'm not saying that the word that you have is not authentic. If you look at Elijah and Elisha and all the prophets that came to him, the word, what they were saying is true. Elijah was leaving. Elisha knew it and Elijah knew it too. But Elisha shut them down. Now's not the time to talk about that. Be sensitive. You must be in order. You may not be wrong, but you must be in order. Because you can have the right word, but the wrong timing, and be wrong because you're out of order. But here is part B to that. And this is why I'm telling you, the reason why I'm sharing all of this with you is because these are the mark of your leaders. We understand the timing and the sensitivity of God. There's been plenty of dreams that I've had about plenty of you. And I have not opened my mouth yet because I realize that it is not the, not the right timing. All right, I know my time is up. Do you want me to move on to point B or you want to save this? No, we, we, we've been here too long. The people, I don't want to wear the people out. It's football. It's football day and y'all been sitting here all this time. <laughs> Look at Liz. The game is over now. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there's two games. Well, see, that's not my fault. Y'all got to stop this. All y'all sports fans, y'all got to stop this. All right, is Sam here? Does Sam check out on us? He's a game. <laughs> okay. All right, let me give you this. Here's the part B to that. What Elisha told them, why Elisha told them to be quiet, because that was not his main concern. He wanted to be with this man 
even if he was leaving. Wherever Elijah was going, Elisha wanted to be. He was so connected and dedicated to being a son that the what and the where did not matter. It was the who and the why, right? This is my father. He has my mantle. I am going with him. Elijah did what he had to do to get what he was destined to get from his leader. And my word of warning to you all is that some of you are leaving too early. You've made your decision to depart too early and prematurely. You haven't been here for the course of the journey yet. And most importantly, you have not gotten what you were supposed to get. You know how I know you ain't got it? Because I haven't given it to you yet. I told you, I've been quiet for the last three years. We've been three or four years. I've been quiet. I've had a couple of interactions with a few of you, but I've been very observant and quiet. I know the mantle has not left me yet. Let me humble the room. I know the mantle has not left me yet. That's how I know you ain't got it. You know how I know? Because when I see people in operation, I can honestly say, that doesn't look like me, God. That's not, what my, that's not what I planted in the life of other leaders. So when I see you acting and you're honestly doing what you have to do, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong per se with what you're doing, but I can also see that the mark of my mantle has not been dispensed yet. So I want you to understand that. And that's going to be your key indicator as to whether or not you feel like it is worth you traveling on. You've got to get what you need. You've got to knock on our door. You've got to go through. I, 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 don't, I tell all of you all, especially for all of you who have my number, I say, you got connection. You got proximity to me. Because I don't give my number out to everybody. You got it. You got pro Now, I may not always answer. Y'all know me. Y'all know me. I'm telling you, Pastor JJ got it. Is, don't take it personal. What you about to say? Oh, okay. Don't take it. I'm almost ending. I'm, I'm not going to go any further. But I, I want you to understand, don't take it personal. You, this is the thing about it that Pastor JJ was saying. You've got to learn how to chase the mantle. You're not chasing me. I know you're not so hard up to get to Pastor Trina, but you want what is on the life of your leaders. And so if that means that you have to chase it down, chase it down. We understand the job that God has given us. We understand the responsibility that he has given us as leaders. I understand the poor that I am supposed to give, right? But I can honestly say that I might not sit there and dial every number that I have, but you have proximity. You have access. Did we talk about that? God has given you access. And it would be a shame to turn away and leave all of this access to go into a world and search for something that God gave you freely. Okay. Come on, Pastor JJ. You end this out because I don't want to go any deeper. We're going to hold this for fourth Sunday. Praise the Lord. You made it through. So I need you all to know this. This is not about us. We've been in existence for about three years. And here's the truth. Many that were drawn to this ministry were drawn to a fad. Who gonna be honest in the room? You were drawn to what you were seeing on social media. You, you, you saw somebody ministering. Um, you saw a chief apostle ministering um, online and so I oh they're starting a DC location so I can go ahead and join this church but now we're trying to teach you what God has given us and we're trying to connect us and you now for those of you who are visitors we ain't perfect for those of you who are partners you know we ain't perfect but I believe that God has drawn you here for a reason not because of any music, not because of any fad, but because there's an assignment on your life that's connected to this ministry. 
How many believe that in the house? There's an assignment on your life that's connected to this ministry. And the only way you'll understand what's here is to be taught. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I do know that there are some who feel that we haven't been the, the most available to you. I want you to know we love you. And I'm not going to yell it. I'm not going to give you a reason why it didn't happen. We, are, we want to be the pastors that you need. Not because we're great. Not because we're the most anointed. Not because we're the best church. I will never claim that we are the best church. But we are a submitted house. And we are submitted leaders unto God. And if you follow this mantle, I believe that eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it entered to the hearts of men what God has prepared for them but it has been revealed that's the part that we don't talk about a lot it's been revealed how many have gotten a revelation that God is going to do something through this ministry God I've got a revelation that people are going to be healed saved and delivered and I want to be connected to what God is doing so this will be the toughest altar call ever. First of all, let me do this. Anybody not saved in the house, come now. If you're not saved, come. This is easy. If you're not saved, the best decision you could ever make in your life is to give your heart to the Lord. That's the easiest and the best decision you could ever make. If there's anybody that's not saved, come. Anybody saved? Ask your neighbor, are you saved? Wait for an answer. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Y'all so quiet. Y'all should be making noise. your name? Derek has come to give his heart to the Lord. All Nations DC, don't, we said we're getting a harvest of souls. How do you celebrate a harvest? Derek, I love doing this. Bringing someone to Christ is my favorite thing to do in the world because every time Someone like you comes up here, I remember me. And I wish somebody would have explained it as simple as I'm about to explain it to you. When you get saved, it's just like when you see two people get married. You, you, you get two people who, who decided to make a, a commitment, but the commitment is verbalized. You make your confessions, right? So what you're going to do is confess your commitment to the Father. All right? Say, Father God. I believe that you raised your son Jesus to die for me. I believe that Jesus shed his blood so that I may be forgiven of all my sins. I believe that Jesus died, but I also believe that he rose. And because he rose, one day I will rise also. I believe that because of Jesus, I am saved. Now somebody make some noise in this house. I said somebody give God a shout of praise because Derek got saved. Derek, let me tell you something. They tired. But in heaven, there's like this crazy party happening right now. So if you ever felt unimportant, I'm telling you that all of heaven is rejoicing just because you just got saved. But we're going to take one minute to join the celebration. I need all nations DC to make the best noise you got. Open your mouth and give God a praise because Derek got saved.
follow that lady right there, Elder LaVon. She's going to tell you what just happened, all right? Hallelujah. All right, quick. So, I know you heard a lot about us and what the expectations are. Is there anybody, <laughs> this is going to be tough. That's why I want you all to sit down. Because if you do this now, you really, you, you, you got a lot of boldness. In spite of everything you just heard, is there anybody that feels like, you know what? I feel called to this house. I believe I need to join this church. If that's you, come on now. Come, 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 come. You bold. You bold. You bold. Anybody else? I see you. You bold. You crazy. Any other, any other crazy people in the room making a decision? Come on. <laughs> Y'all are crazy. You joining this church? Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. Where's the other bold people? Come on, come on, come on. You are bold. Hallelujah. I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait one more minute. If there's anybody else, if God has told you to join this house and you're bold enough to do it on a day like today, come on now. Nobody? I know we, we too crazy. I got you. Come for it. Come, come for it. Come on. Are these all HU students? Oh, no. She said, no, I'm not. Okay. She said, no. Okay. You look young enough to be a student. She said, I graduated. I'm not a student. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an alumni now. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Jaswan. Mar Mariah. Jasmine. Rika. Chelsea. Can we give God a praise for all of these? that have made a decision to join this ministry. Come on, make some noise, All Nations DC. As we've shared today, we are not perfect, but we're submitted. And we're so grateful that you've allowed the Holy Spirit to lead you to become a part of this house. If you'll submit to what God is doing here, your lives will never be the same. Because we're going to stretch you we're going to push you. We're going to challenge you. But I believe that you're going to grow. And I'm telling you, eyes, I mean, people are going to see you like, what in the world happened? Because you're submitted to the Father. Welcome to All Nations DC. Follow that beautiful lady there. She's going to walk through the next steps. All right, everybody stand. Let's go. This is the tough part. Give me three minutes to do this. Don't nobody leave yet. If there's anyone, it's going to be tough. I want you to be honest. If there's anyone that's been hurt since you've been a part of this ministry, it's going to rip this thing open. You've been hurt since you've been a part of this ministry. You felt forgotten or forsaken. Have enough strength. Find the strength to come down here now. Let's heal this thing right now. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Yep, come on, come on. And don't y'all look judgmental either. Come on, come on. You can let them come. You can let them come, Jason. Just come right across the front. Yeah. This is what we don't do. We don't glorify emotions. I need y'all to say that out loud. We do not glorify emotions. But we don't ignore them either. We are called to you just as much as you are called to this house.
everybody open your mouth and start giving God praise right there. Y'all too quiet. Open your mouth and give God praise right there. Because they had the boldness to be honest. Because some of y'all sit in your seats and y'all get on the phone and talk about it. But at least they were bold enough to be honest. Some things we pray about, some things we pray through, some things we love through. But this is what I want you to do first. I want all the leaders to take down your pride and come up here and love on these people and repent to them by how they feel. I need all the ministry and elders to come down. Ministers and elders come down here now. It's how this, the Bible doesn't say we'll know them by their anointing. Oh, y'all too quiet now. He said you'll know them by their love, not towards me, but their love one for another. you've been failed in leadership I apologize to you for anything this house could have done better for any way you felt dropped for any way you felt ignored for any time you felt forsaken I apologize to you as your pastor. And what I ask you to do is to stay connected to the oil. Oh. quiet but somebody's getting healed now we always think healing is physical but somebody's being healed emotionally now can y'all pray with us now as healing takes place at this altar for any area you felt failed for any area you felt isolated, for any time you felt alone, Somebody pray, God is healing now. He's healing. 
He's healing. He's healing. He's healing emotionally now. Yes, Lord. Can y'all pray for somebody else? Come on, pray. God is healing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Can you intercede on their behalf now? That he would heal their hearts. Remove the offense. We come against the offense now. In the name of Jesus. We, we come against their feelings of being forsaken even now. Why art thou cast down, O oh my soul? Hope thou in it, God. We would not let church hurt be a stumbling block in this house. against every offense we come against all the trauma and residue from past experiences that has leaked into this house and we brought with us we kiss it goodbye and we say father have your way because I'm moving forward I'm leaving it in the past and I'm moving to new things your hands now father we thank you for you make all things new we are renewed emotionally we are renewed physically we are renewed mentally we submit even our offense to you you said, cast your cares upon me. So we cast those cares on you now. We cast that old hurt on you now and we forgive. We forgive those who have trespassed against us. We forgive those, I don't hear you. We forgive those who trespassed against us. We will not hold it against them. We will not hold on to our, the offense, but we realize that it's a weight and we release it. And we will no longer allow the weight to hold us hostage. But Father, we claim healing from it now. And we move forward. We move forward even personally, outside of ministry, anything that's been trying to hold us back, we move forward. Old offense, even personal struggles, we leave it behind us and we move forward. In Jesus' name. And now, Father, lift their heads. Oh, glory. Lift their heads, Father. For you are our shield and our glory and the lifter up of our heads. Father, continue to lift them now. Now, as we leave this place, may we never leave your presence. Father, continue to be with them and be with us. Continue to allow the healing process to take place. We even come against addiction now in the room. We prayed for our brother the other night. We are still praying. You are still able to break it now. Break it now. Break every addiction. In the name of Jesus, Satan, loose your hold even on these that have been bound by addiction. We loose it now in Jesus' name. Now unto him. 
who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be all the glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Both now and for everyone, lift your hands and say, thank God. Thank God it is so.